I'm Paul Sullivan, your host of the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, sublime, strange, and silly aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men often feel they have to hide or at least not talk about their parenting role. I know this from firsthand experience as the lead dad to my three girls, three dogs, three cats, and somewhat remarkably, three fish. I did this all while managing my career and striving to be an above average husband. One thing I know for sure about being a lead dad is it's not a normal role. You're not doing what dads have traditionally done, going to work and leaving the parenting to mom or someone else, nor are you always welcome into the world where moms are the primary caregivers. But here at the Company of Dads, our goal is to shake all that off and focus on what really matters, family, friendship, finance, and fun. Today, my guest is Tony Moss, famed Boston chef, James Beard award winner, and newly minted lead dad. Tony is a legend in the Boston restaurant scene. Craigie and Maine attracted a loyal following eager to indulge in the chef's creations. It spawned other restaurants, including a burger joint by Fenway Park. Yet being the chef owner and being there for your family isn't always easy. People dine at night and they want you there. Spouses and kids are at work or in school during the day when you have more free time. Tony never closed his restaurants during the pandemic, shifting things around to make it work, but it did fo force him to rethink a few things. And top of that list was the years he would have left with his son before he went off to college and how he could support his wife, a public school teacher, in the most challenging educational climate in recent memory. Tony, thanks for being my guest today. So amazing to be here. I love that introduction. I have, uh, I, I, I got some catching up to do. I only have one wife, one kid, and one <laughs> dog, and no cats. The key is uh, you can expand to, to a, a cat, but just stay with one wife, okay? Uh, I've got stories for another podcast. <laughs> I'm all for that. But, you know, you get a good one, um, things are okay. So I got, a, I, got a I got a great one. My wife knew this, this person once who found out that uh, her husband had a whole other family in France. And it just blew my mind. I'm like, God, it's, so, it's complicated enough being like the husband to one person and the dad, like, a whole separate family in a whole in a different country uh it, it, it didn't didn't end well I and mean, this probably goes without saying i was about uh, to say that that is probably a different kind of podcast too that, that's a different kind so. of podcast um but you know look chef um i know we've talked before and, you know chef it's hard you know once a chef always a chef but a great chef uh, let's start off with you know the cooking question what was your least favorite thing that someone ordered at craig Yanni? you know the thing <laughs> that had to be on the menu but when they ordered you like, I can't believe they ordered that. Um, you know, it, that's a great, that's an interesting question. I was not anticipating this route. We, we, uh, we were fortunate at Craig Young Maine to be able to write, you know, menus daily and change them daily to, you know, sort of suit our whim and, and my whim and stuff like that too. But every once in a while, you'd have someone who, you know, not, I don't even want to say it was like the worst because that would be a terrible way to put it. They can't, like, we were always honored to have people come into the restaurant, but it's like you, you didn't come in, if you did your homework, you didn't come into this restaurant to do your thing. It just wasn't that kind of restaurant. It was supposed to be, yeah. you know, it was a very chef driven restaurant. So, um, I, God, I mean, you know, the, the funny, the funnier ones were always the, you know, at one point we had, um, we were very famous for our hamburger. We were not a burger joint by any means, but we were famous for our burger at the bar. It was on the cover of Bon Appetit and all this stuff. It was absolutely nuts. <clears throat> and then people were like, oh, you should really do a vegetarian burger. And I was like, no, no, no. Finally, one, you know, one year I said, fine, for fun, we'll do, a, we'll do a veggie burger. You know, everyone's been asking for this veggie burger. We put it on the menu and no one ordered it. <laughs> like, everyone was like, that's so cool. I'll have the, I'll have the regular Craigie I'll burger. I'll have the regular burger. You know, or... <laughs> Or then you'd have people come in to try it and they'd be like, so can I get bacon on my veggie burger? And you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. You eat the veggie burger with some foie gras put on top yeah, of it, exactly. like foie gras, bacon, you know. Absolutely. You're like, yep, here we go. That's totally fine. Glad I worked so hard on this. It's great. <laughs> All right. I got, I got to, before we get into another news you can use question. I'm under the yeah. impression that yeah, whenever I go to a restaurant, nice restaurant, I never order the chicken. I always think like, why sh should I order the chicken? I I'm not going to order chicken. The chef's going to do other stuff, and particularly like the yeah. roast. Is that yeah. a mistake? I know every great chef can can really, you know, roast a, a chicken, but is that a mistake? I don't know, to dismiss I don't know if you're chicken? asking the, the right guy or the wrong guy because you're about to go down a rabbit hole here. Like a roast <laughs> chicken to me is one of the most sublime, beautiful things to eat. It's just perfect. That said, 
like if it's the type of restaurant that's going to look at it as this ubiquitous thing that they have to have on the menu, no, you should not order it there. But if it's the type of restaurant that's going to, like a real chicken that's been raised well, fed well, like that actually tastes like something. It doesn't taste like the thing that comes wrapped in <laughs> plastic or whatever in the market that literally is as bland as can be, which sometimes people would be like that. Like, why should I order the chicken? It's going to be bland. No, a real chicken, a real chicken is unbelievable. So if you can, if you have faith in the, the sourcing and the restaurant and the, and the chef and the cooking and all that stuff, I think it's a wonderful way to like enjoy a meal. Uh -huh. Um, that's that's my take, and it, you know we we have a roast chicken in our house at home, at least once a week, and I literally mean at least once a week. Okay, all right. See, I've yeah. learned something new. That's good. Yeah. How'd you keep How'd you keep everything going? You know, in the the pandemic. I mean, it was it was tough for everybody. It was particularly tough in the restaurant business, and and I know you you know you just made it work. But how, how did that happen? Like, I have know? no idea. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I'm I'm a pretty competitive guy. And I, um, and I, we, like, we never closed the credit. I mean, through snowstorms, we were famous for the menus we'd put out. Like people would literally uh, cross country ski to the restaurant and we would check their skis at the door and have these great things. You know, we, we were always there for our community. We didn't close in the marathon bombing. We didn't do it. We were two blocks away from, you know, a lot of the craziness around Cambridge that happened. So, you know, all of that, um, so our mentality was like, we need to be here for the community. It wasn't about keeping the, in the beginning, certainly. It wasn't about keeping the business afloat. We didn't even have time to think about that. We were like, if you, you know, you just, if you can go back to that period, everything just closed and no one knew what to do and no one knew what was going to happen. And like, you know, two weeks, like everyone knew it wasn't going to be two weeks, certainly not right. in these parts. Right. And we were like, well, we got to feed people. Like, that's what we got to do. And especially when there are all these grocery store shortages and all the things that you read about, we're like, well, I have access, you know, to great stuff. Let's, let's do it. So we just put our helmets on. Were, were you like, like your regular customers, were you giving them like, you know, a roll of toilet paper and some paper towels with their meal? Cause you had access, you know, cause that, we, that, that we, was the rush. Roll, roll of toilet papers. No, <laughs> I didn't think of that. Why didn't I think of that? Um, but like, you know, we were selling, you know, on the, on the menu, we had all these family style meals that we were developing and, you know, then we'd also sell like five pounds of flour, and, you know, some eggs and this butter and spice rubs that we were making and stuff like that. So that people, you know, were having a tough time finding some of these basics knew that they could place a food order with us and then also not have to worry about some of the, the staples. But, um, I mean, just going back to, to your question, how did we do it? We, we willed it. We just didn't see stopping as an option. And in a weird way, uh, if you could put that period in a vacuum, it was the most creative period, I think, that I and the restaurant had ever seen because we had to, we completely, I mean, we were a fine dining tasting menu restaurant. Right. That food doesn't go in a box. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work. I, the first day I did, I tried to put it in the box and I looked down and I saw this cute little, you know, whatever. With a little, little, little sad, a little it. sad. Yeah, yeah, in this box. And I'm like, oh my God, it's not traveling, you know, 10 feet to a table to be consumed within the next five minutes. It's going, I don't know how many miles being consumed and I don't know how much time. And I don't know if they're going to put it in the microwave or drop it or it's going to turn upside down in the car ride home, but they're going to eat it and have to enjoy it. So we had to rethink everything. And in that, in that way, it was exciting. I had a, unfortunately, I couldn't always think of it that way because there was so much else swirling around that was so awful. We just kept on doing the work. I mean, I also, you know, we had a furlough, the majority of our staff, and I was coming in with just a bare bones little crew. I think it was four of us, and someone's girlfriend, you know, to help us. And uh, I went from being the, whatever my, title was you know chef owner of three different restaurants the being the prep cook dishwasher pastry chef line cook everything marketing guy every part of it um to make it all go but that's also what led me to the decision to step away yeah well, like, well, you know what? we'll come we'll come back yeah. to that but you know i'm thinking you know yeah. we're now just past sort of when we're talking the two-year anniversary of, of sort of when everything shut down and you know had somebody told us back then you know this is going to last for about, uh, you know, two years. We wouldn't have sure. believed it. We wouldn't have been able to handle it. You know, when you, you start in a crisis, it's that passion, that power, that, that, that desire to do something. But you think 
in your mind, you may not put a time period on it, but you think, oh, this will yeah. be a couple, well, a couple months. This is this is, right, this right. is the United States. Well, we'll figure this out. I mean, this will be done by, and of course, that's not what happened. So what was it like, the sort of ebbs and flows of both your own business, but then, you know, your wife is a public school teacher, so she's, yeah. you know, teaching remotely. Again, does anybody think you're going to teach remotely for more than a year? No, uh, a couple months maybe, and then you have a son who's, you know, you know, he gets to junior high school then about to go into high school now, but how did all of that, all those different factors, how did you, you sort of, you know, weigh it all and balance it all as you were trying to keep going all three of you, all three of the people in your family. I mean, sometimes to our own detriment, yeah, uh, you know, we're us, us humans, we can be pretty resilient. So I think when part of the not knowing forces us to keep on pushing forward and, you know, without the answers, just saying tomorrow is going to be a better day. We're going to figure this out. Let's, you know, my little family unit, um, you know, we would remind ourselves, you know, we're sticking together, you know, literally my wife, my son and I would be like, we're in this together. We're going to, we're going to be there for each other. And uh, I mean, beyond that, I, I think, how do you, there's no like, balance. I mean, it never felt there was an option to balance. It was so out of balance. It was so out of yeah. whack. And you're just holding on for dear life. Um, and I, I don't want to sound like overly like dramatic, but that's the way it felt. I mean, I was having panic attacks. You know, there was nothing that I, I'm proud of everything we did. Um, but I can't look back on it as like the glory days because it was nothing right. like that at all. It was just not having the answers and watching the, you know, our financial uh you know position with the restaurants and stuff like that just literally go through the floor not to the floor like through the floor <laughs> you know and and we you know again we didn't know ppp was coming in those days there was no talk of that yet and you know all the grants and stuff like that that all came much later so in those first few months i mean it was just me sitting alone in a dark restaurant after people would have left saying i can't believe this is the way it's gonna end like you know crap well you know and then definitely a little woe is me until i you know my wife and and some good friends were like you're gonna figure this out or it's gonna you know you you've got you've got some talents and some skills like it might not be in the restaurant business but this is you're gonna be okay and your family like you've got such an amazing family um and that might sound cliche too but i do i have an amazing amazing family both you know, in here in this little house of mine, and also the ones that are that you know that I've grown up with, just you know, cousins and mom and dad, like everybody, brother, you know, have been just terrific. So, you know, I there were dark days, and and there was um, a lot of asking for for help and guidance. Yeah, you know, yeah. Now, you, you mean so you, you will it through? You you make it through the the pandemic, and then you know when you and I talked before you sort of have this moment, uh, you know, last summer where you decide, you know, it's time for a change. You know, it's time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Tony Maws, you know, great Boston chef, James Beard award winner, you know, famous restaurant, you know, uh, well-known throughout the Northeast and beyond. And, but you said, you know, it, it's time for a, a change. Talk, talk to me about that, that, that moment and, and, and some of those conversations yeah. you had with your wife and your son. Yeah. I mean, I love to cook food for people. And I was never burnt out of that, you know, the, both before the pandemic, um, it was never for being this great chef or anything like that. I truly enjoy cooking food and cooking food for people. And, uh, and in that sense, the pandemic really fed into that too, because people were so happy, so grateful for what we were doing and what we were providing for them. But, you know, uh, not that young, I'm 52 now, you know, my son is 13. And I was thinking like, I don't see this ending, like, not just in the pandemic, but restaurants in the industry have had a lot of challenges in terms of the whole formula for a long time now. So even, you know, before the pandemic, I was asking myself, how does this continue? And then as we kept on pushing and pushing and pushing through all the ebbs and the flows, the highs and the lows, I began really trying to think like, where's the math going to work with this when we do get out of this and so much has changed. Um, and it's not like my lease changed, you know, it's not like my landlord all of a sudden changed, but I changed and the dining public changed. 
and what they're looking for has changed and their perception of what's safe and not, you know, what they're looking for is all different. And I, I don't know if I can wait that out. And I'm sitting there at this point with knee, literally knee braces on my knees, you know, because I've been, I'm, I wasn't at this point in my career supposed to be running up and down the stairs. And I mean, I told you, I'm not joking. Like my little watch would tell me I had done 25,000 steps daily, you know, um, and there was no chiropractor, you know, that was going to be yeah. able to take care of me. And I was like, holy crap. And I was seeing my family even less, you know, I was out the door before eight in the morning. Uh, I was coming home late when everyone was asleep. And I'm like, enough, like just enough. It actually, I, the part that was harder was more my, my ego telling me that what am I going to be if I'm not a chef than actually making the decision not to continue on with the restaurant, if that makes sense. Because my, my identity has just been tied up in this world for, you know, I've been an owner now for almost 20 years. I've been cooking for over 30 years. This is what I've done. And, uh, and I, I certainly wanted some things to be a little bit different, but I never thought for a second that I wouldn't be doing this. It wasn't like a plan to one day stop. So I really had to kind of go through the mental process of figuring out um, if and when I did stop, then what happens, you know, and am I okay with that? And I didn't have the answers and it was really, it was really challenging. It was really hard. It was, uh, it created a lot of anxiety because I didn't know, uh, you know, I think I told you too, I might, my, my, you know, I was joking with my wife, like, well, I'm supposed to be having a midlife crisis. Here we go. You know, this is a little bit, a little bit maybe bigger than what I thought it was going to be and not so made up. Like I'm literally about to change everything, everything. Um, but, but you make a good point there, Tony, when you talk about, about ego um, yeah. and like who we are as men. And it's something that I, you know, wrestled with in the year that I thought about, you know, starting the company of dads because as I've told everybody, the only thing I wanted to be as a kid growing up was a writer for the New York Times. That was it. If I, yeah. and, and, I, and I didn't ever think it would happen. I was like, I, I don't know. I grew up in, you know, outside of Springfield, Massachusetts. I don't see how this is going to happen. And it did. And But when you think about when you said, like, you know, what am I going to be if I'm not chef? And and I thought you had the, the most ridiculous thoughts when, you know, what, what matters in life is, is is your family. And, you know, you, you're going to have a career. You, you'll find a way to support your, your, your family. But you have to, you know, if you don't have your family, what do you, ha you have? And I remember thinking at one point in the year of saying about this, like, I wonder if they'll take away my New York Times email address, you know? It's like there's certain power to having a New York Times email address. And then I was like, what a stupid thing to think about. But what is that if not, you yeah. know, identity and an ego and you know you still live in in cambridge i know you you're moving shortly but you know you're, you're walking the streets where people know you um what's the reaction been not just from the you know the public at large who would say hey there, there's tony moss but but from those yeah. those customers those clients those really loyal people who came in you know several times a month and you know they became your friends oh my god they absolutely became my friends and and they're so such wonderful people across the board i mean we uh I've had nothing but support and and well wishes. That said, that you know they're like cautious about it too because you know I, I haven't I haven't come out and said what I'm doing yet because I also don't know what I'm you know what I'm doing yet. So they don't know if they're supposed to be cheering me on like full on or consoling me or 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 what you know. And it's I think it's actually a combination of all of anything and everything, every emotion that you could possibly because there's absolutely some loss. I mean, part of giving up this thing and the identity and my restaurant, the closest thing that I could, um, I think equate it to is, is, is mourning. You know, this is who I had to, I had to bury this. This is who I've been. I had almost bury that Tony Moss. And, uh, but you what you think about it, you work so hard to become that, that Tony Moss. Oh my that God. Version of I, yourself. Like you, yeah. Like you said, it's all I ever wanted to be. I mean, before, I'm old, man. You know, before before there was Instagram, before there were, you know, anything on TV. You know, I I was that kid who was watching Julia Child and stuff like that. And and before we didn't know the chefs' names. That's not what it was about. But I I was 15 years old when I was a dishwasher, and the cook showed up drunk, and they fired him. And they said, "Tony, get over here." And I, I I was the happiest kid in the world. This is unbelievable. This is the best game in town. And I never wanted to look back. Um. So, you know, people have been, I think, curious and, and um, 
you know, for a while, I think they were hopeful that I would come back. And when I came out and said, nope, that's not happening. Uh, I think, you know, most everyone understood. I mean, the thing about it happening now is that there's been so much change. We've read about so many different people and industries that have just undergone such incredible, dramatic transition that in that sense, it wasn't um, like, you know, crazy news. Like, oh my God, he just completely did a 180 or something like that. It wasn't right. like that. Um, if anything, I'm almost falling in line with a huge segment of the population. It's, but, a, it's the, the great resignation, just in a, a different way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I resigned for myself. Uh, <laughs> But it's the community's been awesome, and and uh, and as I go through, you know, right now I'm I'm like the king, you know, coffee dater and stuff like that. I'm just having coffee with anybody and everybody I can, just trying to figure out like what what's out there in this world. You know, it's yeah. a completely different. I haven't had to think about it. There's jobs that exist now that didn't exist last time I had to look for a job. So right. it's been it's been a lot of fun just reaching out there with. I wrote a resume for the first time in 25 years just to go through the act of it and, and look at it. And, um, you know, you take out the word chef and all of a sudden I'm looking at this and I'm like, wow, I was like an entrepreneur. I, I managed teams and I, you know, organ I came up with the customer service model and I, you know, did the financial stuff and I did the marketing and the PR and I'm the head of the creative department. Like, wow, how do I, how do I frame this now? And, and people are, have been kind of actually excited to talk to me because I think I bring a different um, background to some of the things that I've been talking to people about. So, Plus, I'd be willing to bet that this is probably the first time that you've really been able to reflect, like to reflect back on you know, yeah. 20 years as a chef owner, 30 years as a chef, because before it was just like, okay, head down, got to do this. I'm going to create something new. I'm going to, you know, try a new restaurant. And, and so you're well, and it's And it's gone through an evolution. I mean, all that reflecting. There was the early days where I was freaking out. And then there was the, you know, walk. I told you about this walk I had with my son. Um, we were on vacation. And this is just, you know, a little while after we, we had closed without, before I had made the formal decision to actually be done done. And my, my son, Charlie, looked at me and he's like, Dad, this is so awesome to have you here. You're not on your phone. You're not at your computer. You're not placing orders. You're not talking to sous chefs. You're actually here with us. This is awesome. And I started to cry. Um, and he, he looked at me and he, because he's such a great kid, he's like, no, 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 not like those other times were so bad, <laughs> you know, but this is just really awesome. And I went back and I looked at Carolyn, my wife, and I was like, I, I think I just made up my mind. Like, I think I'm done. Like, yeah. just whatever, you know? So I had to get through that part of the reflection before I could then actually think about the next and it took a lot longer i mean you read about burnout and you know and mourning and things like that and and you think that you can just muscle through it because like i said earlier in terms of the pandemic put your helmet on you'll just plow right through yeah but your brain your brain's a complicated thing and, and it didn't want me to i would sit down to try to write you know the story or some people wanted me to write the story or or the resume or, or reach out to people and i literally couldn't i couldn't get there i, I just couldn't wrap my mind around it yet it wasn't ready and it was only two months ago, you know, I closed in August and it was just like two months ago that I actually began thinking, okay, here we go. Let's, let's figure out what this next is. Let's start having the conversations. Let's, you know, because it's also really, it's really humbling. It's scary. Like I have to admit, not just now to myself, but when I'm doing this, I'm admitting to other people that this is a different Tony than what they had known before. And I might not be good at it i'm not coming i'm coming with whatever expertise i had but now i'm talking to you about something completely different and yeah. that's holy crap that's that's scary i love that story about you and your son you know walking on the beach and the moment you know i have three daughters but my favorite thing to do is not to take all three of them out at once because that's actually a horrible thing to do because then they start to fight <laughs> that's actually no fun at all but it's those moments i get with just one because I, I know that something's going to be said. Something there's going to be an interesting conversation. There's going to be a sort of a deepening of our relationship, but I don't know when it's going to happen. You know, is this? It's not like you know, with, with being a lead dad, with being a parent, you can't just say, "Okay, hey, I got this time. Uh, it's uh, seven thirty on a Tuesday night. Uh, let's sit down and, and talk." You know, it doesn't come out that way. It's 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 moments like that. It's that walk on the beach 
you know, with your son or, you know, it's, I, I love taking my daughters around to different things with their friends because they turn the radio off, you know, you hear sure. all this stuff, but you only get that by being able to, to be there. Um, well, also, well, exactly. So it's being there. So now I've had a ton of those conversations and they're not, they don't need to be in such a profound place. They can be on the way to hockey practice. They can be on the way, like I, but I didn't have those moments before I was in the restaurant, you know, yeah. and I would, I would convince myself that I was being, you know, present that I, that I was that guy. And I would like almost force myself into conversations sometimes or something like that, but they didn't happen naturally. And now like he and I will go for a walk and like go to a coffee shop or we've had, you know, go to a taco joint together or have pho. And, but it's us, it's us being us and talking about something or nothing. Sometimes it's deep and meaningful. And sometimes it's about the Red Sox, but it doesn't matter. The point is that I'm, I'm actually present in those conversations physically and mentally there were times before where i'd be sitting at the breakfast table and i'd basically be, you know be so tired and so overworked and so stressed out and i'd be like drooling on myself and i'd be like i hate to say it but i'd almost be like faking it to him and to my wife like that i was present and sometimes my wife would call me on it you know she's like you're not here you know you're not here and it never i i, I mean it's my own, it's my own thing. I, I don't regret any of the things that I've been able to do. Um, cause I've, I've been very fortunate, but I had to get beaten over the head with a pandemic to actually realize what I thought was important, what I, what I really believe in and how I, how strongly I feel about being there for my family. Yeah. Talk to me about, I know you, you, you're home now. I hear you have, uh, the, the most demanding, uh, restaurant clientele ever that you've been cooking a lot for your wife and son. Yeah. What's it been like? What have you talked to me about your days? I mean, cause this is like before you're throwing a party every night and you may be free on a, a Tuesday evening to be home, but you certainly weren't free on a Friday or a Saturday because nope. people want to see the exactly. chef. Yeah. What's, what's it been like, you know, these past, you know, six, seven months, um, being there. It's, um, I don't know if there's one word that would encapsulate, you know, everything about it, except for that I know that I made the right decision. I just feel incredibly grateful and happy and content and, you know, nervous about the future, of course. But um, but we, we were a strong little family before and now we're even stronger, you know. So just being able to, to be, like I said before, like be present. You know, my wife... You know, I don't, you can't put on a scale like which um, populations of people have had it worse. But let's just say teachers are not having a great time of it. They didn't have a great time in the pandemic. They're not having a great time now. It's just a holy, holy moly, you know. And and she has to put her boots and her helmet on every single day to go to go teach just to to make this happen and to be there now to be supportive. And yeah, I'm a cook and I can put together breakfast and lunch really easy and make sure dinner you know, it's happening and stuff like that too. So mechanically, so to speak, you know, I can make that happen really easy, but it's more about just taking that away from her. So she doesn't have to even think about it. There's just, I mean, I'm sure you're realizing this now too. And I never, I, I pretended to appreciate it, but now I really appreciate it. Like taking care of the house, not, even if you're not hundred percent, you know, it takes a lot of time. It just does. Like yeah. I'll turn around and realize, oh my God, it's it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. Where'd my day go? And and you know what I've done is I've gone to Costco and Wegmans and taken the kid to hockey practice and took the dog for a walk into the vet and you know I had to do all blah blah blah. And it's it's real work. It it takes real time. So just to to be able to enable enable her to not have to think about this right now, you know, not that I'm doing it better or worse than she did or whoever might, but just that she doesn't have to worry about it. I, you know, um, that's, that's just been humongous because there are days she literally comes home. I imagine similar to the way I've looked, she's so exhausted, so beat up, um, and has to come back and do it again the next day. And yeah. I just, I'm like, what do you need, babe? You tell me what you need. You, you I'm taking Charlie to hockey today. You don't even have to worry about it. You know, um, your lunch is already ready for tomorrow. Don't even worry about it. Uh, you know, Mac needs grooming, you know, our dog, like, cool. Don't even worry about it. You know, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm going to go pick up my mom, my dad, take them to the whatever, you know, just tell me what you need. Yeah. And to be able to ask that question, Hey, what do you need to someone else regularly is pretty amazing. And and it's not just my little family. I mean, it's my, my nearest and dearest other parts of the family and my friends, you know, I, one of my best friends, father passed away. 
and it is a, a dad, you know, that I grew up with. He was, I, I've known him forever. And, and so he was like a, another dad to me, you know, and I was able to be there for him. Mm -hmm. The family was sitting Shiva and I was there and I literally turned to him and his name's Pete. And I was like, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this before. I'm so grateful that I can be here for you. I feel like I owe you for all the years that I missed being there for you, you know? And of course I don't, he doesn't think of it that way, but it just meant it was meaningful that I could not just for him, but for me to be there for that guy. So, you know, I, there are all these books that are written about how we're moving too fast and all the decisions we're making and, and how, you know, harmful it is. And, and you read them and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. At least I was, I get it. But then you didn't get it because you would go off and you continue being you and to right. be able to transition to this place where, um, I'm really, I'm really happy to be able to be a dad and a husband and a friend and a son and, you know, you know, in ways that I wasn't able to be for a long time. Tony, thanks for being my guest today on the company of dads podcast. I always uh, give my guests the last word, but I have to ask the question because you're, you're a great chef and you're cooking up these meals every day. But I can just imagine like this mound of, of like pots and pans and like you know, <laughs> carrots all over the floor. What like who cleans up? Are you everything now? Are you back to yeah. being everything? I know. Yeah. In, in my every once in a while, um, Carolyn will be like, uh, you, you know, you don't have a dishwashing crew to come by and clean up after <laughs> you, right? You know, um, where we take turns. It's coincided really, really well with a uptick in the amount of chores that Charlie has to do. So Build, building character right there. I love it. Exactly. He, he, he wants a new phone and you know, some other responsibilities and Hey, you got to earn it, buddy. So here we go. No, we, we, we all take care of each other. Um, it, it's, it's part of it, but it's, uh, and it's a lot of fun cooking at home. It's a lot yeah. of fun cooking at home. That's great. Thank yeah. you again, Tony. Uh, I'm looking forward to your next move. I know you're, you're literally moving house, but whatever you do next, I know it's going to be interesting and exciting. And thank you again for talking to me today. Oh my God. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing this incredible podcast and the website of yours continue to grow. It's, it's really been fun to watch. 